Uh, all right. All right, we're here. Uh, this is my good friend here. We're back on the Agent Talk. All right, let me, let me backtrack. Okay, this is this, this will be the intro. What's good? We are here on the Agent Talk podcast. Uh, for those listening on the audio, we have a very special guest today. Uh, this is my good friend, Daniel Escobar. Daniel is a man who I just kind of ran into one day. I think we are doing something for church and just ran into him, struck a conversation, and then, you know, developed some sort of bond, you know. So, Daniel, one, welcome to the pod. Uh, just to start us off, for those that have never heard of you, have no idea who you are, who are you? Yes, sir. I mean, I, I like the whole man of mystery thing. So I like that, that twist you just had on it. Mm -hmm. um, but you are 100% correct. I think it was just a little church gathering that we kind of just ran into each other. Uh, there was, I think you were wearing a sweatshirt or something that had your logo, uh, the agency oh, and you know, intrigued me. So that's what, you know, sparked up the conversation. You know, my wife always makes fun of me because she's like, how do you just, you know, approach people and ask them questions? I'm like, well, if I got a question, I'm curious, I'm going to ask, you know? Mm -hmm. So that kind of led to that. But, you know, a quick summary of my life is really um, I've had a great and a blessed life to really experience a lot of different things in my life. You know, starting from my childhood experience growing up as a missionary kid. So I actually grew up in South America in Colombia. Uh, lived there till, you know, 10, almost 11 years old. So kind of got a whole different perspective of growing up in, a, you know, at the time, uh, I don't know if it still is, but, you know, a third world country. And this was also, you know, we're talking uh, late 80s, early 90s. So Columbia was going through a lot of stuff at that time. I, I feel like Hollywood has really taken a take, you know, they took some sort of spin on that with the whole Pablo Escobar. Uh, so it was quite an interesting time to be growing up. But when you grow up in a certain element and that's all you know, you know, that that is a norm. So you don't really see a different norm until you're taking out of that and placed somewhere else. Uh, so it was right around 97, 98 is when we moved back into the States and, you know, kind of just made my way assimilating back into the States, realizing, you know, all the blessings and amazing things that the United States had, you know, little things, especially, you know, when you're 10, 11 years old, you're talking about like McDonald's and, you know, movie theaters and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so got to jump in on that and uh, did middle school and high school down in South Florida. Uh, so lived down there with my family for a little bit. Um, and it was right around that time where, you know, it was, I think everybody kind of goes through, you're trying to figure out what you're supposed to do in life, what direction you're supposed to be going in, you know, is college the right choice, all of those things. And it just so happened that in my life, there was, uh, my older brother kind of made some decisions and joined the military. And that was right before 9-11 had happened. So that was something that really kind of, uh, inspired me and, you know, I was, I was very humbled to be his brother and to know that someone would really pass up a lot of opportunities that he had to go join the military. This was pre 9-11. And then to see him fulfill his duty, knowing that when he signed up, we weren't at a time of war. But then he continued on with his duty and really did the best he could and served his country as best he could uh, throughout the rest of his enlistment time. Really was a big inspiration for me and had uh, quite a big impact on my life. Uh, which in turn led me to actually join the military as well. So did that for just about four and a half years um, and then got out of the military, went back to college, got my degree at probably the greatest university in the world, University of Central Florida, and uh, got my degree from there. And that kind of, you know, spun me around and led me over to Nashville where, you know, I happened to meet to what I believe is the most beautiful woman in the world. And, you know, she kind of stole my heart, a little Southern belle, and she pulled me over here to Nashville and been living in Nashville since. And, you know, we just so happened to start attending the Hills and want to start getting involved. And then we went to that, uh, I think it was called like a leadership meeting or something like that. Or, yeah, that's you know, where it was. yeah, so it was one of those leadership meetings and we went to that meeting and man, that's when, you know, I saw that sweatshirt, man. So that was kind of a quick little synopsis there. Okay, so now going back to Colombia. Uh, yes, sir. How for the like I've never been to Colombia. Never been to what someone would say is, you know, a third world country. Yep. What is life like in Colombia? Like just to start. Yeah. So obviously, my perspective is only going to be, you know, from when I was growing up there. Because now, when I go and visit, it's you know, it's far and few in between when I can plan trips to go and visit. As a matter of fact, I think the last one. Don't quote me on the date. I believe it was. 2019 February was the last time I was there. 
and I got the privilege of taking my wife. Uh, my brother got to take his wife, so that was the wives' first time for them to go. Um, so I got to do that and kind of show them a little bit part of Columbia. But you know, it's very, um, it's very beautiful, and uh, you have to look at it from a different perspective. Obviously, you know what we have here in the United States and all of the blessings that we have here is one thing, but then when you go to a different country, you know, their blessings are going to be a little bit different and their beauty is going to be different. You just have to really sit back and try and look at it through their eyes. Uh, so the different parts and regions that we go and visit to mostly is one is kind of like a little uh, farm village, farm town that uh, most of my uncles live in now. So we're talking, I mean, they still got donkeys pulling carts, you know, on the road, you know, you still got your street vendors selling you fresh fruit that they just picked either from their farm or their backyard and they're trying to sell it to you. Um, so you have that kind of perspective, you know, um, little things like air conditioning, you know, that's a privilege to have air conditioning. So it's just one of those things where, Hey, you have to kind of step back and realize it's like, man, we got it real good. Yes. It's like, we got it real good. Um, but then, you know, you definitely have some cities, for example, the other one that we visited was called Cartagena, uh, which is a very big city, very popular city, you know, great for tourism, great for visiting, you know, we're talking restaurants, hotels and stuff. So you can kind of see where a country would be like, Hey, we need to fund this to kind of pull in tourists that that way we can show them a good time. But I don't, I, I highly recommend everybody to visit Columbia. I think it's actually, it's a beautiful country. The culture is great. The music's great. I think some of the best food in the world, obviously very biased speaking, but it's a fantastic time. Now, your parents were and are missionaries, correct? So my parents were missionaries. Um, mom is no longer a missionary, but dad still works in the mission field a little bit. Um, he's getting to the age, you know, where I think he's focusing more on his nap time as opposed to anything <laughs> else. All right. Uh, yeah. So, you know, usually his phone calls now, you know, we'll talk about the Lord and we'll talk about how many naps he's taking today. So you can, you can tell he's kind of regressing a little bit and trying to take more of a, a backseat approach. And, but, you know, that head of his is full of wisdom and, you know, the experiences that he's had throughout his life is something that, you know, he loves to share and he loves to share with up and coming pastors. So he does more of like a mentor, you know, like kind of like a mentorship, uh, uh, leadership roles and kind of coaching from the background. So he focuses on that a lot more. So someone that, because I feel like the word missionary is used, like people, that's a word that's used, is a word that's known, but it's like, what does a missionary do? You know, from your experience, if someone came to ask, hey, Daniel, what does it mean to be a missionary? What is that? Yeah, so for my life as a little kid, you know, missionary was, you know, our focus in Columbia was really trying to find an area in Columbia that we needed to bring the word of God to. So dad's focus was, hey, we need to find this region here. We're going to start a church. We're going to start gathering, you know, as the Bible calls us to do is to, to gather and speak the word of God and start to gather and build a church and kind of see where it goes from there. Uh, allow the Lord to dictate where the path goes from there. Um, with that being said, as a missionary, you have support from other churches. Now, a lot of times it's global support. So churches all over the world, if you work for a certain organization, are going to be helping you and monitoring you and coaching you and any sort of things that you might need. So while we're in Columbia, you know, we're raising the church. Dad was the lead pastor there. Mom, you know, is doing a lot of the women's minister, um, uh, missions groups and stuff. And for me as a little kid, you know, I'm just kind of smiling, playing with my G.I. Joes, you know, really just trying to soak it all in. Um, but funny enough is our summers, a lot of times it's like, hey, we're going on vacation to the United States. But our summers are also to not only go to the United States, but then we would travel across the United States and go visit these churches that have been supporting us. Because a lot of times, you know, when churches are, you know, taking money and giving for, uh, for you know, on Sundays, they don't really get to see where that money is going and what that money is doing. So I think it's a great thing for missionaries to really show, be like, hey, this is what we're doing. And, you know, a lot of times I'm a visual person as well. So whether it be pictures or videos, you show them, hey, this is the church. This is the church community. These are the people that, you know, are attending this church that you are providing your tithings for this to happen. You're helping with the electric bill. You're helping with the water bill. You know, we're, we have, a plan to expand here and to put in our own baptism, you know, a little area where we can do baptisms at church. So get, really getting to see that and other churches getting to be a part of that, you know, just brings 
the whole world together a little bit. Uh, so that was kind of really the focus as far as for me, for my life as a little missionary kid was, you know, just being supportive, helping out dad wherever I could, you know, trying not to get in trouble for taking my GI Joes into different churches and, you know, sneaking them in my pockets here and there. And that's about it, man. Uh, okay. So a little fast forward. So you brought up 9-11, right? And at this point, your older brother already in the military, uh, what did, and you, the answer can be nothing, but what did seeing, you know, what happened on 9-11, what impact did that have on you where you were in your just life? Yep. So at the time, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I was in ninth grade in high school. So, you know, ninth grade or high school, you're trying to figure out life. You have no idea. You just made a huge transition. You went from, you know, being the big kid on the block in middle school, heading over to ninth grade. Um, so older brother was gone. I knew he was in basic. And I'll never forget, man, it was English class. So I'm sitting there and some teacher walks in, whispers in the ear of the other teacher. And then she pulls over, you know, that little old TV cart, pulls over that TV cart, plugs it in. And sure enough, you know, I see this. And at first, you know, I think like a lot of people's reaction is like, you know, is this real? Like, what is really happening? And then immediately my mindset switched to, man, I think my brother's going to be going to war. Like, this is, this just got real. And um, it was pretty humbling. Uh, but at the time, I was just, you know, there's just so many questions. You, you just don't know what's going to happen. What, you know, what's going to, what are the actions that are going to be taken by the U.S., by the military? So I, at the time, I just had no idea. But I definitely had a feeling in my gut. I was like, man, Sam is in it for the real deal now. And it was a matter of, it was actually a matter of weeks before we even heard from him because he was in basic training, actually, when it happened. And his whole basic training unit had gone into kind of like a lockdown. So we didn't hear from him for a while. And finally, when we did get a phone call from him, he had no idea what was going on. He didn't really have any details. And we kind of just had to fill him in. I was like, Sam, like, you know, this is what happened a couple of weeks ago. And this is what the news is saying. This is what the president's saying. So it's kind of just this open discussion. So it was definitely a very interesting time for the family. What, when did the catalyst come for you to say, I want to go to the military. Like, I know your brother went. When yep. did that point reach for you where it's like, I'm doing this? Um, I think there's a, I think there's definitely, hang on. I think I lost you there for a second. Okay, you're back. Um, I think there was, there's definitely a point, and especially for my life, I don't want to speak for everybody, but when you're finishing up high school and you're getting ready to go in college, you know, there's, there's some people who are extremely blessed and know exactly what they want to do. And that's fantastic. You know, that they have a passion, they have a drive, and they know what they're doing. They have some sort of purpose. Uh, for me, when I finished high school, I really didn't have anything. I, I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to study in college. I wasn't even sure if college was the right move. Um, and there was, it was during my brother's second deployment, he actually got injured on that second deployment. You know, and he had to go, you know, he was sent to the hospital and he had surgeries and he was overseas. And, you know, the concern is like, man, they just try to kill my brother. And, you know, all these emotions, you know, you're 18 year old kid. I just had, you know, a lot going on. And, uh, no. and I think it was at, at one point where I just decided I was like, man, I don't think college is the right move. I don't even know what I want to study. I feel like I'm going to waste money. Maybe I'll just go do this military thing and, you know, kind of not necessarily take vengeance for my brother, but in some way kind of finish what my brother started because his enlistment was cut short due to the medical injuries. Um, so I think a lot of that had to, to do with my decision-making. Uh, he did recommend for me to at least give college a try because he went into the military right after high school. And not that he regretted it, he loved it, and he had a great experience, but he said, you know, if I had to play it back, I would have maybe just at least gone to college to give it a try. So, you know, older brother, he's wiser than I am. So I, I gave college a try and I, I did pretty good first semester. And then second semester, just really lost all focus, lost all motivation. Um, didn't find a purpose to be, be going to class or even trying anymore. And then that's when I kind of had like this self-reflective talk with myself. and was like, you know, what am I doing here? I'm just wasting my time. Had a conversation with my brother, told him, I was like, listen, I gave it a try. I, I really did try. But, you know, I, I think the best thing for me is to kind of go go into the military and really kind of clean myself up a little bit and, you know, gain my perspective and get my priorities back in line. What would you say to someone who is considering 
going to the military, kind of like you said, maybe you got this 18 year old out of high school, has realized that, you know, college maybe isn't what's for them, but has some sort of inner desire or calling to go serve their country, but they're hesitant, they're fearful, we're like, you know, we would see the recruiters that come to, to the high school, I'm, ain't no way, I'm going, what? No, <laughs> but like you said, you know, I think you expect, you have mentioned this, it, it takes someone of a certain cloth, you know, to be cut from a certain cloth. What would you say to that young man that wants to go, but has hesitation or fears about going in whatever sort of aspect with the military? Yeah, and you know, there, there's definitely a lot of questions and there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of unknown. Um, I will say this, you know, my, my time in the military was by far one of the most life-changing events that I, I ever encountered so far. Um, it definitely set a precedence for my work ethic um, it set a precedence for my behavior. Um, so it definitely has a lot, a lot, a lot of positives. There was a lot of great things that came out of it. At the same time, there are some negatives to it. I mean, you know, uh, in the line of work that I was in, I, I was deployed a lot. I was gone a lot. Um, unfortunately, you know, my family was unable to know where I was, how long I was gone for, what I was doing. So there was a lot of, I guess you could call like secrecy as to what I was doing. Um, which I know put a, a big toll on the family. Uh, you know, they, they don't really talk about it too much, but I know it was, it was difficult for them just because they just completely had to just trust in me and know that, hey, I, I will contact you when I can and things are going to be okay. I just have to go do what I got to do. Um, so there is some balancing for those, you know, men and women that want to choose to join the military, you know, there's just certain things that you're going to have to be willing to give up, you know, whether it be anniversaries, uh, birthdays, uh, holidays, uh, big family gatherings. So those are, you're going to have to weigh those perspectives and see, you know, is it worth it? Um, but for me, I think volunteering, you know, whether it be in the military or other forms of volunteering, you know, it's through volunteering that I think you really get a good glimpse at grace. It's when you are doing something for somebody else, even though they may not deserve it. So that's where you get this small glimpse of grace. And to me, grace is just a beautiful thing um, that it's in the volunteering that you see that. So I always, I highly recommend everybody, you know, even if it's not in the military, find some sort of volunteering, something to do that's outside of yourself, that you're not doing it for your own self gain. Now, in the military, was there self-gain? For sure. But there, there is a lot of the military, especially the farther in it that you go, that the more the volunteering, the more dangerous the job gets, but the more you're able to help. So I would say, you know, really consider it. Um, I think it's a great opportunity, but at the same time, it's not the only opportunity. So there is certain people that I think are really cut for it, kind of like you say, certain cloth. Um, and if you are that cloth, I mean, it's going to be a great experience. But there are those that I think you really have to just weigh that perspective a little bit before making a, a big commitment like that. Because once you sign that paper, you win. You're in. Yeah. What would you say is the biggest misconception about our military or about those who serve? Like, is there any one thing that stands out to you is like, this is where truth is? This is where public perception is. Is there anything that jumps off to you? Um, I, obviously, I think the, the troops now, I think times are extremely different now in 2020 than when I was in. So my enlistment window, I, I would say, after I was done with all my training and everything and I was really active and deploying was between 2008 to 2012. Um, so that was a big push going into the war into Afghanistan. Uh, things in Iraq were starting to cool off a little bit, so we were transitioning more into the war in Afghanistan. Um, so I do think it's difficult, or at the time, it was difficult for people to really see it's, you know, what we were doing there. Um, so when you're there firsthand and you see the struggles that these people are having with certain terrorist groups that were just, you know, kind of forcing their way on them, it's very difficult to just stand back and not do anything about that. Um, I know there's a lot of people that will say it's like, hey, you know, we shouldn't even be there in the first place. And that's, you know, a discussion for another day. But there was just a lot of good that was going on. A lot of people that were trying to help and trying to help those people that were in need. 
And, you know, it's difficult to show that, whether it be through the news, the media or anything like that. But I don't know how many times, you know, we'd get hugs and thank yous. And, you know, we've been under this regime for so long and you guys are finally here to kind of have that show of force and that presence. Um, so I think the big misconception is a lot of times, especially for the kind of groups that I was in, where people just thought we were just going out in the middle of the night and just, you know, assassinating people. Where in reality, it's like, hey, we're just trying to establish some sort of sense of peace that these people can live the life that they want to live without being ruled over by somebody else just because they have the money, the weapons, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think that was probably the biggest misconception, trying to, you know, I guess bite my tongue a little bit when I'd come back and you would see in the news that we're just out there, you know, killing women and children. Um, I think that was probably the biggest misconception I would see. Now, with your group, you know, whoever, you know, I don't know all the right terms and whatnot, but what is the bond like? Like, I've played a sport. You know, the closest thing I can think of is it's like low key. Like, I was talking a little, I was like, dang, you know, when you come to the reality of what some men are doing to serve our country, it's like, man, the closest thing I can get is I played a sport, you know, but <clears throat> y'all are still a team. You know, y'all were a team. What is the bond like with those men that you did these missions with, that you served with? Like what, I guess, give us a glimpse of what that relationship is like with your other brothers that were serving with you. Oh, yeah. And like you said, I think you're getting really close to it, you know, when it comes to the sport. Like I, I grew up playing sports my entire life, all kinds of sports. Um, so that bond that you have, you know, the in the locker rooms and the getting on the bus and traveling to the opposing team and during the game, during wins, during losses, all of that emotional roller coaster, you know, that you see in sports, it's very relatable when it comes to the military. Um, to speak on my own personal experience with my time in the military, I was in, you know, a smaller group. Um, and the best way to explain it is, you know, it's the special operations. So each military branch has its own representative, I guess you could say, in the special operations. So to get in there, you kind of have to earn your way in. There's different courses and uh, classes and uh, things that you have to do to earn your way in to get in there. Um, and each time you do that, you have to volunteer to do it. So when it's a volunteer program or it's a volunteer school, it kind of gives the military a little bit of wiggle room to kind of really test your limits, you know, whether it be mentally, physically, emotionally. Um, they find different ways to present stress in certain situations to see how you're going to react, because what they want to do is they want to weed out those that, hey, you may be a great individual um, and serve a huge purpose in the military, but not for this specific thing that we need. So a lot of their programs and their courses is to weed that out. So much like, for example, in your experience playing sports, you know, you start off in Pop Warner and everybody's playing. You just got to show up and sign up. And then as you start getting closer and closer, you know, you start getting to high school, now you have tryouts and you have to earn it. You know, you got to be a little bit faster than this guy. You got to bench a little bit more than this guy. You can't drop enough balls like that guy. So you start earning your way and then you have your high school career and then you go into college. Now people are going to be looking at, you know, how you're playing on the field to see if you're going to make it to that next level. So kind of the window starts getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I truly think as that window gets smaller and you have different experiences through those processes, as you get there, you start looking at each other like, man, it's like, hey, I know you're a squared away individual because of what you had to do to get here. Does that make sense? So when you finally get into that group, the bond that you have with these guys that I serve with, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable because you know the extent of their volunteering. A lot of times they say in the group that I was in, you know, you're a four-time volunteer because of the different four courses that you had to go through to get to this point. So the amount of volunteering that you had to do, you know, the wife jokes around, says that we're a little bit crazy, but yeah, there might be a couple of screws loose, but we all have the same loose screws. And that's kind of what builds that bond. So I like example, that. Yeah, I got I got a group text that I have with a couple of guys and the wife, you know, at first when we first started dating years back, she was just amazed at how often we talked. She's like, you guys talk more than my sister and I do. And I just say, I was like, you know, it's just it's a bond that you have with these individuals of like, man, I know exactly what you went through. And because of that, I just love you so much. You know, so it's just this huge bond there that I think, you know, these guys, I just can't wait to the day where just we're all old, 
gray hair, bald, you know, will be those guys with the veteran hats on, you know, yeah. trying to get a free frosty or something, you know, yeah. can't wait for that time, but uh, it, it's a good friends great for life, you would say. Oh, for sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. Sure. So you, you alluded to, so marriage. So what is life <clears throat> like being married? Now, I still know you have certain roles within the military and helping or whatever it might be. What is life like serving with the military in the aspect that you do while also now being married? Because when you entered, there was no wife. You know, what has been, I guess, that difference and shift for you? Yeah. So while, while I was active duty in the military, um, no wife. And um, definitely, I think it would have been just way too tough. And I salute those guys who, while I was in active duty, who were married and with kids, I, I can't imagine just because of the lack of communication, the, uh, the so much unknowing, I can't, it just incredibly difficult looking back on it now. Um, nowadays, I do more of a um, civilian contractor role with the military. So I still serve uh, the military and still help them out as best I can. I still go on deployments and help out the troops overseas as best I can. Um, but to be quite honest with you, I mean, the wife is the cornerstone of this house. You know, she is the foundation for sure. And everything kind of bounces off of her, you know, because in reality, she is the anchor and has to hold it down here the entire time while I'm gone. So she is here. She's the representative. She's holding it down. And, you know, I'm doing my best to help her out. But I think, and we would both agree because we talk about it all the time, I think the number one thing that has really helped us out and has made this marriage successful is communication. I mean, you, you just have to lay it all out there. Um, none of this like, uh, oh, well, I'm feeling something, but I don't say it. it's like, hey, if I'm feeling something or I'm thinking something, I'm saying it. You know, I got to communicate it. Because if there is no communication, you know, too much will go unsaid for too long. And then now you have a distance that can kind of get into, you know, quite a tricky situation. So I think communication is by far the biggest uh, contributing factor to our success so far. So let me ask you this thing. Finish this sentence for me. A good husband is what? Or does. Is or does. Finish that sentence. A good husband is, let's see. A good husband is, that's a good question. Those are the good I, ones. I don't want to like, they, you, can't, they can't respond right away. I said, those are the good ones. I think a good husband is someone who loves unconditionally. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the, the number one thing because in my perspective on marriage and life is just loving her unconditionally. And what that means is for me, what it means is, you know, every single day I love her every day. I'm finding new things on why I love her. And people ask all the times like, Oh, how did you know? I was like, well, I knew this is how I knew then, but I can tell you how I know today simple things like today like i needed a favor and she got it done and sent me a little happy face and an exclamation like man love her so it's like every day i know why i love her you know i i don't want people to think that it was just this one moment and i'm hinging on this one moment of when i fell in love and this one moment is going to carry me for the next 35 years it's like no every day i find that love and every day i work on that love and every day i love her unconditionally um, but at the same time, there's going to be certain times that I may not like her too much for what she's doing. You know, she might be driving me crazy, but it doesn't mean that I don't love her. So I, I love her no matter what. There just might be some times that, you know, she does something that I'm like, what, what are you doing? But <laughs> I think, I think the unconditional love is, is the number one thing for me. So that okay. to me, is a, a good husband or successful husband, someone who just loves unconditionally. I, so I flip that question in to, to the woman that are listening from the perspective of, of a husband a good wife is what man for me I think a good wife is just supportive and that's why I feel like I hit a home run with my wife is she supports me no matter what you know I throw out some of the craziest ideas sometimes and she's just like, I think this is crazy, but if you're feeling it and you think it's good for us, for you, for the family, whatever it may be, she's like, I'm with you. Ride or die. Let's go. 
So she is supportive of me no matter what, you know, and a, a big statement to that is, you know, with what I'm doing, I'm, you know, I'm constantly deploying and doing this and that. And sometimes I'm not going to have to, I'm not going to be able to communicate with a couple of days because bad internet and all that stuff. And no matter what, she is a hundred percent supportive because she knows what I'm doing is, is a good thing. And she knows that what I'm doing is providing a good thing for the family. And so she's just extremely supportive. So for me, from my own perspective, I would say support. Going back a little bit. So you brought up, obviously, you, know, you have roots with the Lord. You know, you talk about the word of God, the Bible, things of that nature. Obviously, I know a little bit more because we have these discussions. Um, was it at all difficult? And if so, can you enlighten us on keeping your faith while serving or if that wasn't if you were like look this is my faith this is what it is it's not wavering the importance of keeping your faith while serving like where was god's presence i guess in all of this with you and within the military you know it's, it's a very funny thing that you asked that because when i told the wife that you know we'd be doing this uh podcast you know and how you know we want to talk about military and god and all those things she's like man I wonder if you're going to tell him about Chris. And I was like, you know, that's a good point. I don't know. Maybe if it comes up, we'll talk about it. Okay. And she started laughing. She was like, well, you're not going to make it through it. If you, you know, cause you'll get choked up or whatnot. And I was like, no, I think I'll try. I think I'll be able to do it. I was like, maybe I'll make Joshua cry, but I'm not going to do it. Okay. Um, but I think keeping my faith through my military experience was huge. Very important, you know? Um, and I think that is why sometimes people sometimes struggle when they get out of the military is they see the military as, Hey, this is the best thing I'll ever do in my life. Like I just did the best job ever. You know, I have basically hit my peak at this time. And a lot of guys, you know, when we serve and we were doing that, you know, maybe 22, 23, 24 years old. And you think like, man, you hit your peak. I was like, man, you have so much life left. But the mindset that you're put in while you're there is like you hit your peak to where when you get out of the military, it's like you would then think your life is just a downhill roller coaster after that. So I think that's why a lot of people struggle sometimes when, when they leave the military. But for me, you know, as far as my own Christian beliefs, I knew that there was a bigger purpose, you know, in life. And I knew that there was more to be doing. There was, there was more to learn. Uh, there was more sharing that I could do. So that was really a, a contributing factor to my transition out of the military and being able to continue on with life and help serve the people. Um, but I did have a moment in the military where I feel like my faith was rocked pretty good. And this is where the story of Chris comes in to where, you know, I'll kind of give you a quick synopsis. Whatever, whatever you got. Yep. Yeah. Um, so the group that I was in, the best way to describe it without getting too far into details was, you know, we were a very specialized tactical unit that our purpose was direct action raids. And what that means is, you know, we have a certain individual that we're looking for and we're tracking them down and we're going to find them because they have been creating all kinds of havoc, whether it be against U.S. forces, whether it be against local nationals, you know, uh, bombs, you know, guns, drugs, whatever it is, you know, so we would build intelligence on these individuals and track them down and find them. And then we would move on to the next one. So we were constantly doing that. So shout out to, you know, military intelligence, because those people are amazing at what they do. And they, you know, they provide the information that we need to be successful to go find these people. Um, so there was a, a group that was having a really hard time in a certain region in Afghanistan. And um, they called us up to see if we could go out and help. So we went to go help. Uh, we got all this information on this uh, certain individual that had just been a complete menace and just causing all sorts of issues. Um, so we set up camp, you know, a little bit close by to where we thought he might be and basically conducted, you know, some, you know, reconnaissance and intelligence stuff to collect as much information as we could. But a lot of times, especially these individuals that are really, really, um, deep into terrorist activity they're very I guess you would say you know very smooth so they're they're hard to track they're hard to find they know what they're doing basically 
so we had it narrowed down to a certain area to where he might be at and we knew that he could slip away and get away from us so we knew that this was probably going to be one of the best opportunities to get him uh, so we went to go look for him and we knew he was in a certain town in a certain village but we were going to have to go after him and a lot of times what that means is you know it's going to we used to call it like a block party it's hey we're going to think he's maybe at this place we're going to go to that that house go look for him and if he's not there try and gain intelligence to find out where he might be you know that person might know be like oh the guy you're looking for he's over there so we went out that night went out looking and um you know it was a long night it was an absolute long night and we were probably at our fourth house or so um yeah, I think it was the fourth one looking for him. And finally, we got some reliable sources saying, hey, he's actually over there. So we felt pretty good about it. Um, and hindsight now, what was funny is when we were at that fourth house, and all of our missions were at night. So everything was at night. And uh, we were at that fourth house. We were getting a small group of guys to go over to this last house. And the call to prayer uh, for the Muslims was going off on their megaphones. And I looked at my watch, and it was super early. You know, it was way too early for the call to prayer. And at the time, I remember thinking, I was like, huh, that's weird. And like, that's way too early. Now, hindsight 2020, looking at it, I was like, oh, that was probably some sort of early warning system for him saying, it's like, hey, they're getting really close to you. We're going to go ahead and flip on this prayer to wake you up so you know, hey, something weird is going on. Um, so we went, a small little uh, contingency of the group went and we went to go to this house and you know we split up the group some went to the first floor uh, some of us went up to the second floor kind of make sure we did a, a, a simultaneous entry into this building and uh, we go we make entry into the building first room we we go into it was a prayer room on the second floor so the prayer rooms there they don't connect to the rest of the house it's kind of like a separate room even though it's connected to the building there's just no door to gain access into the rest of the building so i run around the other corner uh, to go into the next door i'm getting ready to kick the door and as i kick the door and we see something just like fall from the roof and it ended up being a grenade that fell through the roof and so what we realized very quickly is that we had walked into an ambush and they had multiple guys on the roof with AK-47s just right above us. And um, it was just basically a firefight that happened within three feet, you know, because we were on the second floor, they were right on the roof. So it was, you know, just muzzles pointing at each other and for, you know, as quickly as you can shoot an entire magazine, you know, it took a couple of seconds, everybody shot all the rounds they could. And then it was, you know, dead silent for about three seconds as you're reloading a new magazine. And then that's when I hear my buddy Chris behind me saying, I'm hit, I'm hit. So take a quick look down. I see him on the ground. So immediately, and this is where training just kicks in and muscle memory, immediately we start grabbing him, pulling him in, and we're starting to pull him back into that prayer room that we were just in at. So I'm pulling the other guys on the team. Now the firing and engaging has happened again because everybody reloaded the magazines, pull him into the room. Um, I had some extensive uh, medical training at the time, so we immediately pull them into the room. They're still shooting at us, still throwing grenades, everything's going off. And um, there's certain levels of care when it comes to uh, medical injuries, you know, especially in the military, that you can classify them as to, you know, how severe the injury is. So finally, when we pulled them into the room, I was able to, you know, take a little flashlight out because um, everything else outside, you have to think night vision goggles, everything was at night. I pull a little flashlight out and I look and I knew instantaneously that this was a urgent surgical situation. Like we needed to get him, they called it the golden hour and uh, we needed to get him onto a surgery table within an hour. If not, the likelihood of him surviving was slim to none. So I immediately call it over the radio saying, Hey, go ahead and call the medevac in. Like we got to get him out of here now. And not only that, I need some medical support here because this is a traumatic injury. So we start working on them. Um, you know, they're still shooting. You know, the bullets are flying everywhere, but we're inside the room. So I'm talking with them. We're still working on them. Um, finally, they were able to engage the enemies that were on that roof. We had sniper teams get set up, and we were able to finally control the situation and deem it safe. Um, so at that point, the medevac, we call them in. They find a field that's about 500 meters away. We have Chris stable at the time, so now we have to – put him on a litter, get him off the second story, carry him out, you know, 500 meters to this open field. But now we're gonna have to go through this town that we just woke everybody up at because, you know, we just had a huge firefight. 
And, you know, at that point, that was the fifth building we'd hit, the, you know, way into the night. So you're talking about lack of energy. You're exhausted. You're, you're, you're running on adrenaline, but you're definitely starting to kind of wean down a little bit because you're just exhausted at this point. So we go out, clear the field, medevac comes in, I pick him up, you know, we carry him over to the litter, I drop him off on, onto the helicopter, we exchange little medical cards with the medical team that's on the helicopter, I look at Chris, you know, and I tell him, I was like, hey, you know, don't think this is an excuse to not go into your next course that he had to do when we got back uh, from that deployment, he gave me a thumbs up, they took off and left. And uh, we then had to walk back to the base just because we had been there so long. We, we missed our ride home. So we had to walk all the way back. So, you know, we walk all the way back. I'd say it's about, you know, five, it was probably about five to eight kilometers. Uh, walk back, get back. And then I immediately walk into what's called, it's kind of like an operation center where, you know, all the phones and everything's at. So I'm dropping off all my equipment. I walk in and as I'm walking in, I just see one of my guys, one of the leadership guys, he's just in tears, just completely covered in tears. And I was like, what's going on? And they're like, hey, Chris didn't make it. And, man, it was, it was tough, you know. Um, but you then obviously start to question a lot. So you start to wonder, it's like, man, you know, why Chris? Why not me? All these different feelings and emotions start coming in. And uh, usually when that happens, when you have someone who passes away, uh, communication shuts down. They don't want you talking to anybody. They don't want you, you know, reaching out to family or anything because they, they need to reach out to his family to let them know what happened as opposed to them finding out through the grapevine. You know, they want to give that soldier's family the respect of hearing firsthand so you know i'm there for a couple hours i'm just taking a shower you know angry you're sad you're kind of in disbelief you know you, you don't really want to believe it especially in my situation i was like man i, I just handed him off in the helicopter he was good give me a thumbs up like thought we were good so you're kind of going through all that and you know just rationalizing your brain or at least trying to but when you're in your own mind you know you just think erratically and emotional so it's so funny because you know i'm going through all that and um i go to check my email now remember i can't send anything out but i go to check my email and uh i see on there i had an email from my dad and i was like oh interesting so i go to read it and then it said here and i'll, I'll read it for you verbatim and said hey it's wednesday August 18th, 2010 at 5.30. So it's 2 a.m. your time. And the Lord brought you to my mind and I decided to pray. I hope you're doing well and that you're walking close to Jesus. I hope you're reading your Bible. And if not, here's a little Bible study for you. And it's uh, Psalm 23. Mm. If you look at Psalm 23, you know, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valleys, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. You're my rod. You're my staff. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me for all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so, you know, a couple of takeaways from that psalm is just one, you know, he presides over me. Two, he protects me. And three, he provides for me. So in conclusion, you know, I'm blessed. And therefore, I should be blessing others. And I abide in his presence. Therefore, I am secure. So, I mean, talk about just an earth shattering experience. You know, I'm sitting there on the computer and you think about it, 2 a.m. my time, what was happening? You know, we were right in the middle of it. So finally, later on, when I was able to talk to dad and told him what was going on, you know, he's crying and he's like, I, he was in a meeting and basically said that something just 
completely came over him and he had to like pause the meeting and step outside. And that to me was, you know, that earth shattering moment to let people know it's like, man, the Lord loves you, mm. you know, no matter what your situation is. So as far as your question, as far as keeping the faith through the military, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that was my foundation, man. That's what keeps me afloat. That's what lets me know that there's something else out there. And that's what drives me to want to lead people to Christ and to share my experience, you know, and to give an answer as to why I have the faith that I have and why I have the hope that I have is a situation like that. You know, you reference first Peter, you know, three fifteen is given those an answer when they have a question as to why I have my hope with love and generosity. So, yeah, I mean, faith in the military for me was huge. If someone asked you, say, Daniel, who is this God that you speak of? Who is he? I mean, for me, the first thing I would say was like, he is the truth. You know, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And then that to me just always leads into a beautiful conversation because, you know, it, it starts begging the question and then going into, well, what do you mean by the truth? And I say, well, the way I look at it is that there is one objective truth, you know, and I find that the truth comes from the word of God in the Bible. And I'd love to share that with you if you'd have the time or if you have, you know, an interest in that and a, and a discussion for that. So for me, you know, God is, he is the truth. And that to me is that pursuit of knowing the truth um, has led me to where I'm at. Last few questions for you. Um, one, so I, a while ago, I listened to a podcast where this lady, she had interviewed, I think it was either a hundred or a thousand, I want to say it was a thousand, um, a thousand people who were at their you know, deathbed, in their deathbed, essentially mm -hmm. three months, two months, one month. And she wrote this book called The Five Regrets of the Dying to let people know these are the regrets that those that have gone on, these are the regrets that they had so that we don't have them as we live this life. For someone that has just in a variety of ways gotten close to death, you know, whatever, whether it's experience and seeing whatever it might be, what has death how has that changed or added to your perspective of life itself? Fantastic question. And um, I think for me, it has just really, as crazy as it sounds, it has simplified life for me. It has really simplified it down to focusing on the little things. Because so much in life now, there's just so much out there that, you know, we could focus on and there's so much going on, but it's just really remembering that the true beautiful blessings are the little things, you know, the, the family, the, the health, um, the opportunities, the, the ability to volunteer and to serve and to love other people. It's like those little things to me now take over the big picture of life. And obviously, you know, the, when I, when you go through life, you wish you did it perfectly. And there's been plenty of mistakes that I've made, you know, and I'll, I'm sure I'll continue to make plenty of mistakes, but it's that constant focus to make sure I'm paying attention to the little things and really not taking the big picture into perspective. Cause when you do that and you take this big picture and you can just completely get lost in it. Yes. And for me, it's the little things and remembering that, Hey, you know, there could be big situations going on and a lot of chaos, but man, I still got my health. I still got my wife. I got a roof over my head. You know, I got dinner. I, it's just those little things, man. It's, it's what's really kind of pulled me back in. So, you know, as far as for me and my own experiences with, you know, being close to death and dealing with that, it's just been the focus of the little things. What would you say? So I guess bad drop. I think I'll touch on this. Like when I was growing up, I had a lack of appreciation for what the United States is, you know, for what, what the U.S. is. And for someone that has gone to, you know, these third world countries, you've seen a little bit more of the world than maybe the average American has. 
<laughs> if you could tell someone, you know, give them one, 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 while well, there's 30 seconds, boom, this is why you should appreciate the United States. Why is that? I mean, I would say the biggest thing is, you know, everybody's going to have their own opinion. So the, you know, and you got to respect everybody's opinion because everybody has their own experiences. So it's very difficult to just put a blanket um, answer on something like that. But I do feel that in the United States, there's just a lot of blessings that we have here in the U.S., uh, a lot of abilities, uh, whether it be, you know, the technology, um, the funding, um, the diversity, you know, in these multitude of states. I mean, there's just so much. I mean, I don't know of another place really where, you know, within 30 to 45 minutes of me, I could eat almost every single cuisine in the world, you know, because I love food. I love to eat. So for me, like just a simple thing like that, it's like, man, I'm just so blessed to be here where there is multiple places in the world that's like, hey, you're getting one food and that's from what we grew in the farm and like, that's it. Like, that's all you're getting. So we're here. It's like, you know, it sometimes takes me 15 minutes to figure out what I want for dinner because I have so many, many options. <laughs> so many options. And I'm overwhelmed with my options. Yeah. You know? So now, is the United States perfect? Absolutely not. It's, no nation, I think, is perfect. I think everybody's in the pursuit of trying to be as best as possible. You know, but at the same time, you have to realize and look at the small things and realize it's like, hey, man, we have a lot of great and beautiful things here. Let's focus on those and then continue to work on some of these other issues that we're having. Um, but I would say, first and foremost, travel. I mean, people who haven't been outside the United States or haven't got the ability to travel, obviously with what's going on in the world right now, travel is very difficult. Uh, so hopefully we'll get back to that soon. But really traveling around the world and seeing the world, I think it's a beautiful thing. And that's been one of the biggest privileges in my life for my wife. You know, I was able to take her to Europe. She had never been. I was able to take her to South America. She had never been. So getting to show her different parts of the world, how different cultures interact and, you know, music and food and friendship and camaraderie, all these things. I mean, it's just a beautiful thing. But it's funny how as much as the world have, as I've seen and uh, it's, there's always this ingrained feeling in, in my heart that's like, man, I can't wait to go home. You know, I just, I can't wait to go home. And, you know, home when I say that as the United States, just because there's just so much here that can be done. And there's so much that we can do being a part of the United States to help out the world. Um, so that'd probably be my answer for you, man. What is next for you? What is the next step for Daniel? Whatever is awaiting you, what is that next step for you? Oh, man, I, I wish I knew that answer, you know? <laughs> um, I feel like the Lord's the one that has the plan, and I'm just trying to abide by his will. But at the same time, um, I truly believe that he puts you in certain situations or um, has you go through certain experiences so that he's preparing you for something else. Uh, he's preparing you for another cause. Um, so I hope that through my experiences of working in the military, you know, now we're talking close to coming up on, let's see, you know, been in and out of the military, I'd say for about 10 years now of work, that some of those experiences and um, values and things that I've learned throughout my time there, I hope that that could be applied to something else. And that could be applied to the glory of God. And, you know, focusing on that, I think, is going to be my next step is how can I serve the community um, and show them the truth and, you know, love on them. And I think that's going to be my next focus is how can I do that with more love and more grace? Last two questions for you. Uh, someone that, you know, you've done a lot of things, have a lot of accomplishments, um, you know, been to places no, you know, nobody else I know has been. You know, you're married, you got such and such, nice creative, nice little workout room downstairs, you know what I mean? Uh, you, what would you say, above anything else right now, is the one thing that you are most grateful for? Most grateful for? I think first and foremost, the thing I'm most grateful for is my wife. I mean, she really is you know, the, my sounding board. So she is the foundation to what I'm trying to do because, you know, if she wasn't around and I didn't have her kind of 
keeping me in check, you know, who knows what I'd be doing. But having her here as my sounding board and as the future of my family, I think is, is really probably the most important thing for me right now is, you know, having her as, as my wife and hopefully Lord willing, starting a family. So that to me is probably my biggest blessing right now. Last question. Uh, so yeah, we're put you in an imagine, imaginary situation. Yes, sir. You, you've done everything that you've wanted to do. You know, you've lived the life that you want to live and you are given a microphone before the end of your time. Okay. And you're able to give one message, however long, however short, 15 seconds, 15 minutes to the world. It's like, world, if I could just give you one thing, this is what I have for you. What is yours right now? I think my biggest thing and one of the biggest mentors for me, especially in the Bible, is Paul. He talks about in the book of Romans, um, I believe it's chapter five, verses three through four. It's, you know, it says, we rejoice in our suffering because suffering produces endurance. Endurance develops character and character gives light to hope. So something that I would tell, you know, the world, if I had that microphone is to know, it's like, hey, you know, life is not easy. You know, there's going to be suffering in life. Everybody's going to suffer. Um, it's what you do with that suffering is what's important and how you react to it and um, how you let it affect your life or how you incorporate it into your life to develop that endurance so that you know that when suffering comes again, because it will, you can endure it again and how you take those experiences to develop your character to make yourself a better person so that you can share those experiences with others that may be suffering as well, that has led you to light so that you can lead them to hope. Um, and I think that's probably the biggest thing. And I heard once, I can't remember where I heard it was, you know, Paul was a man of grace and grit. And mm -hmm. I just love that statement. I, I loved it. And I just, I would tell people, it's like, man, if you can live a life, a life full of grace and grit. I like that. You know, you will you i think you would just you would live a beautiful beautiful life so th those would be my closing statements you know is just to you know to remember that hey we're all going to suffer and we got to do something with it what are you going to do about it and then two is live that life full of grace and grit because if you're full of grace and you got that grit and that grind to work man it's going to be a beautiful life and you're going to have such an amazing impact on other people it's going to be a great thing to watch I like that, man. Grace and grit. Ooh, that might have to be uh, used again, man. That's solid. Okay. Like t-shirts, hats, whatever you want. Let's yeah, go. I was thinking like, dang, that could be a brand, man. That's where my mind goes. But that's what's up, man. Well, I appreciate your time. Uh, you know, for those listening while you're on YouTube, the audio platform again, this is Daniel Escobar, um, good friend of mine. You know, I appreciate your transparency, your wisdom. Yeah. You're definitely someone that in however many weeks, you know, Daniel's on our Bible study group and just – Every time, you know, he, he gets on, he comes with that stoic wisdom, you know. So <laughs> definitely appreciate you. Uh, you know, if there's anything I can do to help you push your vision forward, man, just let me know. And then aside from that, that's all I got. And we're out. So much. Okay.